Well, happy New Year, Life Bridge. How are you guys? Good, good. Hey, uh, a few years ago, I made a trip down to our mailbox right after, uh, right after I got home from work and got to the mailbox and started flipping through the mail. Usual things were there. We got some bills. We got a bunch of coupons to stores that we're never going to shop at. Like, how many mattress coupons can really one company send out? Um, and there were some letters there, and I'm, I'm flipping through the mail. I'm looking at everything. And, and then I got to something in the mail that, that caught my eye and made me stop. It, it was, it was addressed to me. It was a letter addressed to me, plain white envelope. And as I'm looking at it, what caught my eye was that my name was, was written in my handwriting. So, so I put everything back into the mailbox and kept this one letter out. And I started to open this mysterious letter. And immediately I thought, am I in one of the episodes from The Office? Like you Office fans, remember when, when Jim steals Dwight's letterhead and sends him faxes from himself from the future? Great prank. And I thought that's what was happening to me. And, and if it is a prank, whoever did this, they did a killer job forging my handwriting. I mean, it's spot on. So I'm opening this letter up and quickly I realized this isn't a prank. This is actually a letter from me to my future self, a letter I wrote all the way back in high school. Now, don't give me credit. I wasn't some really, really insightful, forward-thinking 18-year-old. This was a school assignment. Like, I, that came back pretty quickly. I remember my senior year, our government teacher made us write a letter to our future self. And, and at the time, I thought, it's a dumb assignment. Why, why are we going to do that? Now, years later, I'm thinking, this is pretty cool. So he made us write this letter. He kept them. And then he promised that 15 years after we graduated, he would mail these letters to us. And that's exactly what he did. So I started pouring through this letter and I'm, I'm really excited to see what I wrote. Apparently when I was 18, my future self in the future, I was going to be a fighter pilot and then president of the United States. <laughs> Lofty goals. 0 for 2. Then I had to write down five friends that I would still be friends with in the future. Three for five on that one. Three of them, yep, still friends with. And then two of them, looking back on it, I probably shouldn't have spent time with in the first place, let alone let them be long-term influences in my life. I also wrote in the letter, make sure you marry Kelly. I didn't really write that. That wasn't in there. I, <laughs> Uh, but that'd be cool, right? I would have scored some major points. Uh, but I also had to give myself advice, my future self advice. And this was interesting to me. I said, here's my advice. Be humble, be bold, and be the friend to people that you want to have yourself. I thought that was pretty good advice. I didn't necessarily always follow it, the, the advice from my 18-year-old self, but that was a great reminder and it's certainly applicable today. So I kind of hope I have more letters to my future self that show up in my mailbox down the road. What, what if we had that for the church? And LifeBridge turns 130 years old this year, 130 years old. What if we had a letter that was written over 100 years ago from our church to our church? How cool would that be? Like telling us what to, to remember and to focus on, what's really important, giving us advice, especially going into a new year with so much that's going on. Everybody's asking, what's going to happen? Everything that happened the past year, everything that's still lingering on, how's all that going to play out? What's going to change? How do we need to adapt? Everybody's asking that question, right? Everybody's an individual. Businesses are asking that question. Schools are asking that question. Our country is asking that question. The church needs to ask the same question. We, need, we made a lot of changes last year so that we could pivot and adapt to, to our circumstances. LifeBridge has always done that. It's been doing that for 130 years. That's one of the many reasons why our church has been able to see three different centuries. It's because we've changed and adapted and pivoted when we needed to. But now, the world's been in upheaval for the better part of a year. So much has happened, so much has changed. Things are still going to change. So the question that we all need to ask as individuals is, hey, with all this change, what needs to stay constant? As things change, what needs to stay constant? A lot has changed since I wrote that letter as an 18 year old. I wrote that letter pre 9-11. Think about how much the world has changed since that. Yet the advice I gave myself, that's constant. That, that shouldn't change at all. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a 100-year-old letter from LifeBridge to LifeBridge. As cool as that would be, we actually have something better. We've got seven letters 
that are almost 2,000 years old. Letters that are just full of rich advice for you and me as individuals, rich advice for us as a church. Letters that talk about change and stress the constant at the same time. These letters are in Revelation chapter two and three, the last book of the Bible, and they're written by Jesus, Jesus himself. And he writes these letters to the churches in the Roman province of Asia, which is present day Turkey. I mean, how cool would that be to get a letter today from Jesus? Can you imagine what that would be like? Like if Jesus wrote us a letter today, what do you think he would say to us? That's the cool part of these seven letters. They are for us today. These are written to all Christians. It's, it's for us right now. Now, these were seven local churches. These were, these were actual local churches in the Roman province of Asia. And Jesus writes so that everybody hears everything about the letters. He actually says in every single letter, hey, make sure anyone who has ears to hear, let him listen so he can understand what the Spirit has to say to the churches. Churches, plural, all of the churches. Geographically, how the cities were laid out and how these letters were circulated also points to the fact that this is for all churches. The first letter is to the church in Ephesus. Ephesus was a port city. If you were going to the Roman province of Asia, you would start at Ephesus and then you would make your way clockwise around to each city geographically and you would end in Laodicea. That's how these letters are laid out. Starts with Ephesus, ends in Laodicea. Every single Christian in those churches are supposed to hear what Jesus has to say. Another reason why we can know this is for us today is because these are letters to the seven churches. Numbers in Revelation are extremely symbolic. They have so much meaning. The number seven means perfect or whole or complete. So when it says the seven churches, that means all Christians throughout history. Every local church, every gospel-driven, Jesus-loving, Bible-believing church, the church is the seven churches. That's you and I right now. It's for us. We can take Ephesus or Laodicea or the church in Smyrna. We can take those off the envelopes as the addresses and we can put Lifebridge Christian Church in Colorado. They're for us. So, so in this series that we're gonna start today, we're gonna look at what Jesus has to say to the church. Some of these churches were doing really well. They were killing it. Some of them were really solid, but you know, just a little tweak here and there. Some of them were kind of a train wreck. Now, Jesus talks about their strengths and weaknesses. He talks about what needs to, to change in the churches, what needs to stay constant. He talks about what's coming for them in the future. In these letters, Jesus says what he thinks about the church and what he wants the church to be. Whether you're a Christian or not, that should grab your attention. What do you think Jesus thinks about us as a church today? What would he say? What kind of church do you think that Jesus wants? Well, we are going to find out. So if you got a Bible with you, open it up to Revelation chapter two. We're gonna jump right into the first letter. This is Jesus talking. He says this, write this letter to the angel of the church of Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. That is Jesus. The one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Those are the churches. Jesus walks among the churches. He's with us. He says, I know all the things that you do. I've seen your work and your patient endurance. I know that you don't tolerate evil people. You've examined the claims of those who say they're apostles, but they're not. You've discovered they're liars. You've patiently suffered for me without quitting. Skip down to verse six. We'll come back to form five. But this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolotians, just as I do. They don't hate the Nicolotians. They don't hate the people. They hate the deeds, just like Jesus did. We're gonna circle back to that in a couple of weeks because Jesus is gonna come back to it and unpack it a lot more. Basically, he says good things about the church in Ephesus. And this is not the first time they got a letter. 30 or 40 years ago, a guy named Paul, the Apostle Paul, he spent a couple years there and he writes a letter to him that's the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. Paul's got some great stuff to say too. Fast forward a couple decades and Jesus says, hey, there's some good things that you guys are doing. You're working hard. I see that you're busting it, guys. You're living on mission. You're introducing people to Jesus. You're reaching lost people. You're making disciples. You're helping people grow deeper in their faith. That's awesome. You're taking care of the needs of your community with some really cool outreaches. Way to go. Like your theology is really good. You know the truth. You know my word. 
Man, you're standing up for justice. That's awesome. Keep going. Also, I see that you have learned how to decipher between false teaching. There's a lot of it out there. And you, you know false teaching when you hear it. You don't fall for it. Keep going. That's great. And I see that you patiently endure suffering. Like some of you are, are being mocked and ridiculed because you're a Christian. People in the city are saying, you're, you're the problem. Christians are what the problem is. We need to get rid of the Christians. They laugh at you. They say that you're an idiot. Some of you have had your businesses boycotted because you're a Christian. And some of you have even experienced physical violence. And yet through all of it, you guys have patiently endured it just like I did. Well done. You're persevering. Keep going. Like how awesome would that be to hear Jesus say that to you? I mean, that'd be pretty cool, right? So basically everything that was going well in the Ephesian church fell into two categories, deeds and theology. They were doing the right things and they had solid theology. So, so that's the encouragement for you and I today. Let's keep doing the right things. If you're a follower of Jesus, he was an individual, do the right things. Serve other people that others won't and serve other people like others won't. It says encourage each other, encourage each other. And then encourage each other some more. Be generous like today is your last day. Be such a blessing in your city to the point where if you left, the city would be heartbroken that you're gone. Do justice because if you won't, who will? Introduce as many people as you can to Jesus and then walk with them. Help them grow, disciple them. Even if you don't have all the answers, like walk with them so that they grow deeper. Man, stay after the word and make sure that your theology is solid. That's the encouragement for you and I. That's what they were doing well. Your theology matters. There's this guy named A.W. Tozer. He was a, a pastor, a theologian, and an author. And he said, what you think about God, like what you think about God is the most important thing about you. Every single one of us is a theologian. We're all theologians, the study of God. Whether you believe that God is the God of the universe, Jesus Christ is God, or whether you believe there is no God, that's theology. We're all theologians and our theology matters. The Ephesians was solid. It was good. They knew the truth. And just like today, they were getting hammered with false teaching all the time. Today, we see the same thing happening. There's bad theology and false teaching everywhere. Unfortunately, today, it's both inside and outside of the church. The, the Ephesians knew how to recognize it. They knew bad theology and false teaching when they heard it. And they wouldn't stand for it. But do we know false teaching today if we hear it? I mean, you and I, we're getting hammered every single day. All kinds of messages all day long. We're getting hammered with theology every day, whether we realize it or not. And the only way that you and I can discern truth from error is if we know Jesus and we know his word. It's the only way. All in all, the Ephesians are doing really well. They're pretty solid. And the encouragement to us is keep doing the things that matter and make sure your theology is solid. But we skip the verse. We skip verse four and five. This is what it says. Jesus says, but I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you've fallen. Guys, decades. Well, look what's happened in decades. Look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, then I will come and I will remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. I don't want Jesus to come to me and say, I've got this complaint about you, Matt. Or I've got this complaint about life, Rich. You don't love me. You don't love other people like you used to. Some translations say of this verse, it says that you abandoned or you forgot your first love. And I don't want to hear that. Jesus was very clear during his ministry when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? Without missing a beat, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. I don't wanna hear Jesus say, Matt, you stopped loving me and other people. Matt, Lifebridge has stopped loving me and loving other people. And if that continues, then I'm gonna remove your lampstand, meaning your local church will no longer exist or to be a shell of itself and completely irrelevant. Now, the exact numbers are kind of hard to pin down, but every year, somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,000 churches in the United States close their doors for good. 3,000. 
That's insane. And for all different kinds of reasons. You know, a lot of people will be quick to say, yeah, people are leaving the church. Millennials, they don't want to be a part of the church. They're walking away from religion. Don't buy into that because that's not true. Don't just listen to the narrative or the agenda that's in the media or with different universities. Because if you do academic studies and see what objectively is going on, church attendance in the United States from the 1930s until now is almost completely constant. It's the same. People aren't leaving the church in droves. They're just going to different churches. They're leaving churches that stop loving Jesus and loving other people and going to ones that do, which they should. Jesus wants uh, the church to love him and love others first. That seems obvious. But apparently this once thriving church, a church that has a book of the Bible written to them, a church that had the Apostle Paul as their lead pastor. Then when he was done, the Apostle John, Jesus' best friend. And then after that, they had Timothy. First and second Timothy in the New Testament were written to him when he was the pastor at the church in Ephesus. These guys had a heritage. They were doing great things for decades. But apparently this thriving church and 3,000 other churches in the United States every year forget the most foundational thing that Jesus wants the church to do. And that's simply just love him and love other people. And if we think that we're not vulnerable to that, then we have already started down the same road the Ephesians are. It's really easy to say, yeah, our church loves God and loves other people. That can turn into lip service really, really quickly. And when I was studying that this week, that was what was kind of the gut punch to me. Yeah, of course, love Jesus, love other people, for sure. And I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying to me, is that what you do, Matt? Do you love me like you used to? Do you love people like you used to? It's like, man, that's convicting. I don't know, I need to kind of do a big gut check on myself. Well, the good thing is we we can see and diagnose what happened with with the Ephesian church. What happened to them? Like, how did they get to this point where they were, they were such a great church, a great church, and then only a few decades later? That's not that long, 30 to 40 years. By the way, you know what the average lifespan for a church in the United States is? 40 years. 30 to 40 years later, now they're having to be reminded from Jesus that they, fought, they lost their first love. What happened? We don't get the specific details of what happened. But based on what we know, there's, there's a couple of things that jump out. One of two things could have happened. I think maybe a combination of both. Here's the first thing. The Ephesian church, they lost their balance. They lost their balance. They lost that balance between grace and truth. And they were really good with truth. They knew the word. They knew theology. It was solid. They knew how to stand up to false teaching, which is awesome. But good theology that is not lived out is worthless theology. To know the truth but not live out the truth means you haven't been changed by the truth. And part of the truth of Jesus Christ is the grace of Jesus Christ. So maybe what happened, they got so bent off on the truth. They were championing the truth. They're being attacked all the time. I mean, Ephesus was a pretty, pretty messed up city. Ephesus made Vegas look like just, look like a monastery. That's how bad Ephesus was. They're constantly being attacked with false teaching. So maybe they got to the point where they were so much focused on the truth. They were so much in in this realm of, we want to champion and fight for the truth, that they just forgot at some point to extend people grace. This is the line that we are supposed to walk as Christians and as a church. We are supposed to stand on and give both grace and truth. Jesus was perfect at this. He's our example. But this is a hard line to walk at times. And if we get out of balance with either one of them, problems can happen. It's two-sided coin. First side of the coin, all truth, no grace. That's brutality. That's just brutal. Have you ever been to a church or met a Christian that's like this, that they are all about the truth? Very quickly, they're quick to tell you what the truth is, what the lie is, where you're messing up, how you need, to, you need to stop buying into this lie, you need to get back to the truth, and they do it in an aggressive, borderline assaulting way. Ever been to a church like that? Yeah, I'm out of half. It was awful. They just beat me over the head with the truth. They didn't care about me. They were just cold, really grumpy, and really aggressive. I don't, I don't ever wanna be a part of a church or go to a church like that again. Me neither. And Jesus doesn't want you to be either. That's not what he wants for his church. Yes, we have to know the truth 
It's being assaulted all the time. We have to stand on it and we have to live it. At the exact same time, we got to extend grace. That's part of the truth. If we don't extend grace, then truth just becomes brutal. The flip side of that coin, all grace and no truth, that's just hypocrisy. If all you're doing is giving someone grace, that's all you give them and you never tell them the truth, you may make them feel good, but all you're doing is setting them up for long-term pain. If you're standing out on I-25 with your back to oncoming traffic in the middle lane, just standing there and I'm on an overpass saying, oh, you're fine, you're doing great, I love you, but I see the semi coming that you don't, that's, that's not gracious at all. That's not love at all. I'm hating you because I'm not willing to tell you the truth. We've got to have a balance of both. If you really want to love someone, you give them equal love and equal, equal truth, equal grace, equal truth. Grace and truth actually balance each other out. When you're light on one and strong on the other, that's when they morph into something that they're not supposed to be. You know, all grace without the balance of truth and grace just turns into a license to compromise. Then all truth and no grace and truth becomes this weapon to attack people with. Neither one of those things are what they're meant to be. Think about this. Think about the best relationships you have in your life. Could be one person, could be multiple people, a friend, friends, your spouse, a mentor. Not somebody that just gives you what you want or tells you what you want to hear, but somebody that, that really wants you to thrive. They sharpen you. They bring out the best in you. They push you to be better. They tell you things that you don't necessarily want to hear. In the moment it stings, but you know, down the road you realize, oh man, I'm really glad they told that to me. That was, that was actually for my benefit. A person that you admire and, and someone that you actually would like to be like. Think about those people in your life. And I bet you they do a really, really good job of giving you a balanced dose of grace and truth because that's what love is. Love is 100% grace and 100% truth. It's both. If you are off just one percentage on either one of them, it's not real or true love. If you're giving someone 99% grace, well, is there still a part of you that just wants to see them suffer the consequences of whatever they need grace for? That's about you. Or if you're giving someone 99% truth, not telling them the full truth, is that just because, well, I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't want to make it awkward. That's, that's again, that's about you. You're being selfish because you don't want to feel awkward. But to give someone 100% grace and 100% truth means you really love them, which requires a sacrifice from you. You got to get over your feelings. You got to get over feeling awkward or stepping into a conversation that might be weird. Something that we say here around with our staff, hey, give me the last 10%. We don't want 90% truth. We want the 100%. Give me the last 10%. What are you holding back that actually could be the best part for me? It might be hard for me to hear, but you're actually showing me grace by telling me all of it to me in a gracious manner. To love someone is to give them 100% grace and 100% truth. That's the kind of church that we have been and we always will be. We, want, we have to strive to be that way. A church that gives the truth, that lives in it, that stands firm on it, but at the same time, we are ridiculously generous with grace. That's how we become a church that is full of people that look like they've been with Jesus. That's the kind of church that Jesus wants. Ephesians 5 says this, goes on and says this, imitate God, imitate Jesus. Therefore, in everything that you do, not some things, not this thing over there that makes it easy to imitate Jesus, but the hard things too. Imitate him in everything you do because you are his children. Live a life filled with love. Live a life filled with grace and truth, following the example of Jesus because Jesus modeled it well. It's 100% grace and 100% truth. Here's the second thing that might have happened with the Ephesians. They got complacent. They got complacent. And complacency always has consequences. I mean, just think about that. Of things in your life that maybe you've been complacent with, what are the consequences? Things that you see our society be complacent with, what are the consequences? I mean, this summer and into late fall, I was doing really, really well with my workout plan and my diet, what I was eating. It was great. I was feeling good. I was having more energy. I was in the gym often. That discipline was turning into a delight. And then something happened. The fourth Thursday in November happened. You're like, what's that? It's Thanksgiving, okay? It's Thanksgiving. 
and I turned to cheat day. And a cheat day is okay, cheat days are fine, but I, I turned a cheat day into a cheat six weeks, and now I'm feeling it. And some of you are too. Like, don't leave me hanging up here. Man, I just got out of that, that discipline. I got complacent with my workout and, and my diet, and now I'm feeling the consequences of it. So I got to start over. I got to recommit back to that and stop being complacent with it. Complacency builds. It just builds and builds and builds. It's subtle to, to the point where you will have consequences that you don't want and you didn't see coming. You know, if you're complacent with a relationship and you stop spending time together, you know, over time, that relationship just dissolves. There's no big blow up, no falling out you had with each other. Just you wake up one day and realize that that, that relationship is gone or it's a shell of itself. If you're complacent with parts of your job, then over time, your performance worsens. And then all of a sudden, opportunities start passing you by. And then one day you get an email from your boss and all it says is, we need to talk. Complacency builds and it builds. I'm complacent with this one day. And then all of a sudden, this day, I'm complacent with that. What are you being complacent with right now in your life? All of us are with something. All of us are with something. This is how a once great church, just three or four decades later, have to be reminded from Jesus himself. I get an email saying, hey guys, we need to talk. You've forgotten your first love, you've abandoned it. And maybe it started just in a conversation. Conversation got a little tense, they forgot to give grace, and then they didn't go back and ask for forgiveness. That wasn't that big of a deal, it's fine. And then it happens again, and it's easier to not go back and ask for forgiveness. It's easier not to give grace. And it happened again and again and again to the point where they don't give grace at all. They're just all about the truth. Maybe they got complacent with, with their own spiritual disciplines, trying to grow and be more like Jesus, like being in the word daily. They started off by being in the word so that they could understand and know Jesus more. That they could be able to, to be more like him and transformed to be like him. But then over time, they got complacent with that and they just turned the Bible into a textbook so that they could read and study and win the next argument next to the coffee pot in the office the next day. Oh, Jim, man, I'm gonna shred him tomorrow. I'm gonna bring this new apologetic that he has never heard. I'm gonna break down Leviticus 2 like he's never even imagined. I'm gonna blow his mind. It, the Bible turned into a weapon to fight against people instead of a weapon for you to be transformed yourself and fight against powers that, were, <laughs> that are not flesh and blood. Romans talks about that. They got complacent with serving. They started off doing a ton of stuff. They were doing good things. Jesus said, I see how busy you are. I see that you're working hard, that you're on mission. But over time, they got busy with the wrong things. And they started passing on opportunities to serve. So you know what? I'm not going to serve this time. Somebody else will do it for me. And they got into this mindset that serving is about performing tasks and checking a box, not realizing that serving is a way for you to be a sacrifice and be like Jesus so you grow to be more like Jesus. Serving is actually for you, for you to grow, for you to mimic. And they got away from that. And they passed up more opportunity and more opportunities and more opportunities to the point where they believed that they were supposed to be served themselves, not the other way around. They turned into consumers in the church. What can the church give me? What can the church do for me? They got complacent with their giving. They had financially given so that the gospel could be taken to other cities and so that people in their city could be, so that their needs could be met and people in the church, they could meet those needs. But over time, they got out of that spiritual discipline. They got complacent with being generous, not just with their money, but also with grace and time and with encouragement. Complacency, it builds. It doesn't happen in a day. It builds and it builds and it builds. So one day you wake up and you say, how did I get here? Nobody wants to be complacent. It's not a newsflash. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Nobody wants to be complacent. Here's the thing. Nobody thinks that they are either. That's the subtle trap. Complacency is so subtle in our lives. It's so subtle in the church. My personal opinion, I think it's one of the biggest problems in the church today. It is just as dangerous as consumerism and bad theology in the church. Complacency has just as bad and damaging effects. That's why this church is gone. You know that the Ephesian church doesn't exist anymore, right? Doesn't exist anymore. 
The lampstand was removed. They got complacent. So here's the letter to our future self today. Here's the letter. Be committed, not complacent. Be committed to loving Jesus first and loving others, not complacent with it. Let's not make it lip service. Too many churches have that as a tagline. Love God, love others. But are we really doing it? Are we really doing it as individuals? And I could preach an entire other message on, on things that I've been complacent with when it comes to loving Jesus and loving other people. I have not arrived with this. I'm a work in progress. But this is the gift is that we get to see this now. We can be committed and not complacent. And Jesus, actually, the good news is he gives us steps. Here's steps to take so you can be committed and not complacent. It's verse five. Jesus says, remember. We've talked about that the last couple of weeks. Remember, right? The power of remembering. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen from. Remember what you were like three or four decades ago. You were killing it then. Remember that. Repent and do the works you did at first. Three steps. Remember, repent, return. First step, remember the gospel. Remember loving Jesus, like actually loving him. When we remember the gospel, we become people that want, not, not feel obligated to, we become people that want to be committed, not complacent. When we remember the gospel, we remember the freedom and the joy that comes from being a sacrifice and a servant, just like Jesus was, instead of being a consumer, complacent consumer in the church. When we remember the gospel, when we remember loving Jesus, we only want to be committed to his church, to his people, to loving him. We don't want to be complacent. Second step, repent. Maybe you've been to a church where this got beat over your head too. Repent, repent, repent. Somebody just yelled it at you, made you feel guilty, shamed you. Repentance turned into to a four-letter word for you. But that's never what repentance is meant to be. Jesus never meant repentance to be a weapon or a guilt trip. He meant for it to be a gift in the church because it's an invitation to something better. It's an invitation for you to turn away from anything that, that you're being complacent about or, or anything that's sinful in your life that's going to lead to consequences that you don't want to have. It's a gift. It's an invitation to turn away from that and do step number three, return. Return to Jesus. Return back to being committed to his mission to reach people and help them grow, to disciple them. Return back to being committed to the community of the local church. The reason why we gather here every week, the reason why we're here is not so that we get to hear somebody preach a message and hear some great worship music. That's not why we're here. We participate in those things. They're important. But the reason why we're here is to be with a community of Christians that sharpen each other and mold each other into the image of Jesus. We're here to be like Jesus. That's what happens. We want to be committed to that. Return back to doing the things that Jesus did. Returning back to the things that he cared about. Return back to doing things that are righteous and just. Return back. When we remember the gospel, we never want to be complacent. We'll repent of anything that is making us complacent. And we'll return back to our first love. Just simply loving Jesus and loving other people. That's the foundation. One day I don't want to say, man, you know what? Uh, I really wish I would have introduced more people to Jesus. I really wish I would have got over my fear of rejection or not having the right answers. And I, w I wish I would have known that it wasn't about having the right answers. It, it was just about being available and being obedient when the Holy Spirit put somebody on my mind or heart and put somebody in front of me. I really wish I would have been more generous with my, with my encouragement. I really wish I wouldn't have passed up opportunities to serve and grow. Like I really wish I would have dove deeper into, into God's word so that I could know it and that, so they could write it on my heart because Psalm 1 says that blessed is he who meditates day and night on the word of the Lord. I wish I would have taken that, like I wish I would have known the truth of that and not been complacent with that. I don't want to say I wish about anything when it comes to loving Jesus or loving other people. I don't want you to say I wish one day or anybody that's a part of our church. So let's start off, letter number one, to be committed to loving Jesus, actually doing it, not just the lip service, be committed to loving Jesus and not be complacent with it. Because if we are, there's, there's some really cool news. This is how Jesus ends the letter. He says, all right, hey, Ephesus, to everyone who is victorious, some translations say to everyone who's more than a conqueror. I like that. 
to everyone who's victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life that's in the paradise of God. That's eternal life. That's what he's talking about. You will be victorious. You will be more than a conqueror if you love Jesus and you love other people. And you're not complacent with it. You will be more than victorious. You will be more than a conqueror if you give out generously both grace and truth. And the promise with that, Jesus says, you'll have eternal life with me in paradise. Remove Ephesus from the letterhead. Put your name there. Because this letter is written to you. It's written to me. And it's written to LifeBridge on January 3rd, 2021. So we got some work to do. We gotta, we gotta fight for and champion in both grace and truth. And we've got somebody to love. Jesus and the next person that you come in contact with. Always the next person. You're all in with that. If you're not complacent, if you're committed to that, what God will do in you and through you, we can't even comprehend. You will experience freedom and joy like I can't describe to you because that's what you were created for. You were created to be on in and committed, not complacent. So let's put that aside today. One of the ways that people get to show their commitment and go all in is through baptism. That's, that's a step for people. Baptism is someone saying, you know what, I'm all in. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I'm committing my life to him. I wanna follow him. I don't have all the answers, but I'm gonna follow him starting today. And we've got people today right now that are getting ready to get baptized. Whenever we see this happen, this is something we get to celebrate. So what I wanna do is I wanna, I wanna pray for us. And then we're gonna sing one more song as a song of response to the Jesus that we love first because he loved us. And we're gonna celebrate as some people get baptized. So, so pray with me. Jesus, thank you for the reminder. Thank you for writing us a letter. Don't let us take it for granted. I pray that anything that we don't understand that you would just make clear to us, that we wouldn't be complacent, that we would be committed to you, that we wouldn't fall away from loving you first and loving other people, that we would model you, that we would give out grace and truth so generously and so equally. Let us be a church and individual people that love like that. Thank you for your truth and thank you for your grace and thank you for writing to us. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.